Welcome, church. It's a blessing to be here with you today. My name is Joey Bottoms, and I get to serve on staff as the youth pastor. I want to read the scriptures for you today. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The Word of God says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. All right, as I begin today, I need to give you two warnings on the front end. Um, first is that the, the, the sermon, and in particular the text we're going to deal with, uh, is going to deal with an adult topic, if you will. And so uh, I want you to know that on the front end. Be aware that that's going to happen. We're not going to go into graphic detail about anything. Uh, but the text does deal with a, a, an adult sort of topic. The second thing that I want to warn you about is that as the Apostle Paul approaches a difficult issue in the life of the church, uh, he's not going to Americanize it, right? He's not about to give them a compliment sandwich. Do y'all, y'all ever get those? Y'all know a compliment sandwich? If you need to say something hard to somebody, uh, you open by telling them something nice, something that's good about them, something they excel in that they do really well, right? And then, and then you, you lay on top of that the difficult thing. Hey, I, I need to tell you about this situation. We need to talk about this maybe difficult thing going on. And then you close it out by reminding them of how great they are and all of their good you know, attributes, all the good things about their lives. The Apostle Paul is not going to do that today. Now, he's not just starting the letter. If you haven't been here with us over the last several weeks, uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So he's writing them a letter. He has affirmed uh, that they are believers. He's writing to what he considers to be brothers and sisters in Christ. He'd spent a year and a half there teaching and discipling the church at Corinth. And so today, he's just going to open it up and he's going to share the truth with this church that was having a, a, quite a few different struggles, but certainly here. So my invitation, buckle your seatbelt because we're just going to jump right in, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul begins and he says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. Corinth was a city that was known for sexual immorality. As a matter of fact, to Corinthianize somebody was to teach them to indulge in all sorts of sexually immoral practices. And yet, as the Apostle Paul gets word from the church at Corinth, he gets word that there is immorality in the church that is not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now, Paul is writing to address two problems at the church at Corinth. The first is this man and his sin. There was a man in the the church who had his father's wife. What this uh, most likely refers to is his stepmother. Now, just to be clear about his sin. This sin was open, it was ongoing, and it was unrepentant. This is not the case of a man who stumbled, got tripped up somewhere, fell into temptation, um, blew it in a moment. This is a man who is knowingly pursuing a relationship with his father's wife. 
Okay, and, and it wasn't something that he was hiding. It's possible that they had walked into corporate church gatherings together arm in arm. As J.D. Greer notes, if you take your mom to the prom, people are going to notice, right? The church at Corinth, they knew about this man's sin, and they were tolerating it. And again, this man's sin was open. It was ongoing and it was unrepentant. Uh, it says that a man has his father's wife here. That verb is in the present active sense. And so this was an ongoing relationship he was pursuing with her but in front of the entire church. So problem number one was this man's unrepentant sin. Problem number two that Paul identifies in this text is their tolerance of this sin. He says about them, he says, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Apparently, the church at Corinth, not only were they tolerant of this man's sin. Now, just to be clear, this guy was a believer. He called himself a follower of Jesus Christ. He wasn't uh, somebody who wandered in off the street and was like, hey, I want to see what Jesus is about. I want to see what this church, um, you know, what they're teaching and what the Bible, like this was, that's not what was happening here. This was a man who had been saved and baptized and called himself a member of the church at Corinth. And week after week, not only were they tolerating his open and unrepentant sin, they were proud of themselves. They were patting themselves on the back, like, look at us. Look how tolerant we are. Aren't we accepting? Like, look, man, we're so gracious. We're so merciful. Like, look, we, we're killing it here as the church of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, you are arrogant. It's as if he's asking them the question, hey, do you, do you not remember that the creator of the world has given us his word and taught us how to live? He's shown us that most clearly in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Like, did, did you forget that God, who is all-knowing and perfect in every way, has called what this man is doing sin? It's almost as if the believers in the church at Corinth had decided they could improve upon God's word, that maybe they knew a little bit better than God, and that in celebrating and accepting this man and his sin, what they were essentially doing was calling good what God had called evil, and cheering this man on as he headed toward destruction. What I want you to know about the scriptures and about God, about sin, is that sin always leads to death and destruction, right? Sin always leads to pain. It always leads to hurt. It always leads to hardship. There are no exceptions for that, that truth. But obedience to Jesus Christ, no matter how painful it may feel for us in the moment, no matter how difficult it may be for us in a specific situation, obedience always leads to abundance, I want to say that again. Sin always leads to destruction and death, but obedience always leads to God's abundance in our lives. And yet the church at Corinth had decided that they'd known better from God. And Paul is rebuking them and calling them arrogant for their positions. And he asks them the question, ought you not rather to mourn? What the Apostle Paul knew about this man's sin was it was ultimately uh, wreaking havoc in his life, in the life of the woman he was having this affair with, in the lives of their families, and it would ultimately wreak havoc in the church. That while they were busy patting themselves on the back, so proud of how tolerant they were, what they were really doing was cheering this man on as he was headed toward death and destruction. Their proper response would have been to mourn the pain and the suffering that his sin was going to cause, not only in his life, but in the lives of those who were around him. And so the Apostle Paul is issuing this very firm rebuke. You are arrogant. Rather than applauding yourselves, you should be mourning. Sin always leads to destruction and death. But obedience to Jesus Christ always leads to abundance. You know, the problem with sin is it's like a weed in our yard. 
And weeds grow, and they grow quickly. And if you attempt to manage sin, maybe just kind of cut it off at ground level where people on the outside aren't going to see that it's there, it's going to spring right back up. And it doesn't just grow when that one plant it begins to spread until it takes over your whole yard. And it doesn't just affect your yard, but it's going to spread to your neighbor and their neighbor. And before long, the whole neighborhood is covered in weeds. And sin is much like that for us. Paul uses the illustration here of leaven. Look down in, in verse 6. For them who had been boasting, who had been arrogant in the church, so proud of themselves for their acceptance and tolerance of sin, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little, little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. Uh, Y'all know bread, a little bit of yeast in bread. It's ultimately going to produce gases that will infiltrate the whole lump of dough, right? Such that the, the whole lump of dough will ultimately become leavened. Paul's like, you should be mourning because this sin that you have tolerated, it's like an infection in your body. And it starts in one place, but if you don't deal with it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to spread. It's going to affect the other parts such that the whole body becomes sick. And so Paul's command here to the church at Corinth is to remove this brother from their midst. There were two problems, this man's sin and the second one is ultimately their tolerance of his sin. The solution to these problems is to remove this wicked and sinful man, this unrepentant sinner from their midst. Now, you might be asking, you know, what's the big deal? He's just a guy going to a church. Why would the Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, being led of God, write in a letter that we should not fellowship with this kind of guy. Why would he come down so hard on a sinner in the church? Because the Apostle Paul understood that the church is not something that we attend. Rather, the church is something that we are. That we are the church of Jesus Christ. A little later, here in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says about us, he says, now you are the body of Christ. We belong to Jesus Christ. We are his body, his church, and we as the church of Jesus Christ have been called to be holy as he is holy. And as we tolerate sin in our midst, as we turn a blind eye to it, or maybe even pride ourselves, and our acceptance of open and unrepentant sin in our body, what we're doing is harming everyone in our midst. We're causing pain. We're causing hardship. And we're harming our witness out in the world. Can you imagine what people were saying about the Corinthian church? Man, those men and women, they claim to be holy. They claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Have you heard about what's going on in that church? It was hypocrisy, and it was damaging the church, not just on the inside, but also on the outside, their witness in the broader community. So what does the Apostle Paul instruct them to do? Expel this man from your midst. You need to remove him from your body. Now, there's a lot of people, I've said this to you before, there is no verse in Scripture that tells you that you need to join a church and become a member. And yet, what we see throughout the New Testament is the expectation is, is that you will belong to a body. What Paul is calling him to do is remove this man from their midst, to no longer allow him to be a member of their church. Um, now, if they were just a group of people that gathered on Sunday and they didn't know who was a member and who wasn't, um, what were they removing this man from? They were removing this man from membership in the church, from calling him a part of their body, a representative in this world of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul uses a really interesting metaphor here. 
to describe um, church membership and what they were doing as they removed this man. So look down in verse 7, the second part there that we didn't get to. He says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And now he's using the Passover here as a metaphor, a teaching metaphor, for them to understand what it means to be in the church and what it means to be outside the church. Are are you all familiar with the Passover? You go way back in the Old Testament where God had chosen a people for himself, the nation of Israel, and they had found themselves enslaved in Egypt under Pharaoh. Now, God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him to let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh's a little nervous, but he ultimately obeys God. And he goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, God wants you to let his people go. And of course, the nation of Israel being his entire workforce, they were his slave labor in his kingdom. Pharaoh was like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And so because he wouldn't humble himself before God, God began to send plagues to show Pharaoh his power, his sovereignty, that he alone was the supreme ruler of the world. And so God turned the Nile into blood and there were plagues of gnats and of frogs, and of locusts. Plague after plague after plague hit the land of Egypt. And every time, God would send Moses back, hey, you need to let my people go. And Pharaoh hardened his heart and wouldn't obey God. Until the final plague. It was a plague of death. Where God said to the nation of Israel, hey, I'm going to send my my angel of death among the people of Egypt. Egypt. And the way that you're going to be spared is I want you to go and take a pure spotless lamb. And I want you to sacrifice that lamb. I want you to take its blood and I want you to spread it on the doorposts outside of your houses. When the angel of death comes and he sees the blood on the doorpost, he will spare the people who are inside. But be careful and make sure that your family is inside the house because you're going to be spared on the basis of people who are in the house and under the blood. Do you see what Paul is saying when he brings up Jesus as the Passover lamb? For those of us who are in God's church, who are in the house and under the blood of Jesus Christ, we are spared from death due to sin, from eternity separated from God in a place called hell. For those who are placed outside of the house, they're not just outside of the house. We are declaring them to no longer be under the blood of Jesus Christ. When Paul was telling them to place this man outside of the church, he was telling them to declare him to no longer be a believer in Jesus Christ. If you don't agree with the word of God, if you persist in unrepentant sin, you demonstrate that you are not a true follower Jesus, remove this man from your midst. In verse 4, he says, When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are delivered to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Place this man outside of the house. And the hope and the prayer is, is that this man will experience what you and I have experienced with sin. It'll take you farther than you want to go. It'll leave you longer than you want to stay. And sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. And that ultimately, the consequences of this man's sin would drive him to his knees. And he would repent and turn back to Jesus Christ and be reconciled with the church, brought back into fellowship with them. It's a painful process in the life of the church. And yet Paul commands it. And he shows us how important this is for us. Now, we don't get the full context of, of how they had dealt with this man up, this man up to this point. Um, this process was not just for a church in Corinth a couple of thousand years ago. As the Apostle Paul teaches us this, you need to know that this is the responsibility of the church that happens to be in Poto, Oklahoma, and Pecola, and in the surrounding areas in 2023, that we should be careful not to allow open and unrepentant sin to persist in our church. Now, we don't get the full process 
Uh, but Jesus gave us a process for dealing with sin in the church in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. This is Jesus, and I want you to know, Jesus was not merely speaking to the elders of the church or the deacons or the leaders or the super spiritual Christians. Jesus was speaking to every man and woman who would call uh, themselves a disciple. If you are in Christ, you have come to faith in him. This is Jesus' command for you to practice in the church. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, he gives us kind of the recipe for dealing with sin in the church. Here's what he says. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. And so the hope of any level of church discipline or the confrontation of sin is not to drive anyone away. It's not to break fellowship. Our hope is never to kick someone out of the church. The hope is we go to our brothers and sisters who might be caught in sin, who may have sinned against us, is to see them repent and be reconciled with us, and with the church, and ultimately with God. Our hope and our prayer is for repentance. And so we come humbly seeking to restore our brother in a spirit of gentleness and being careful that we too don't fall into the sin that he's been tempted with. But if he doesn't repent, Jesus says, there's another step that you should take. At first, you go by yourself, not gossiping to a dozen people before you go. You go between you and your brother and you show him his sin. If he doesn't repent, Jesus tells us we take the next step. He says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. What this might look like for us in the church is you go with your small group. You say, listen, we've been doing life together. And what we see is this pattern of sin in your life and you're not being repentant. And today, because we love you, We want to show you your sin from the scriptures and call you to repent of that sin. Jesus continues, if he still doesn't repent, then you need to tell it to the church. Step three of this process that Jesus gave us is to bring a man or a woman to the church and that together we as the body of Christ would speak with one voice in unity, calling sin sin and ultimately calling that man or woman to repent. And he continues, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Gentiles were regarded in this context as unbelievers. Tax collectors were known as sinners. We're treating them as unbelievers and placing them outside of the church with a hope that ultimately they will repent and be reconciled back to the church. Now, this process of discipline should happen all the time in the church. Hopefully, it never gets past step one. That when we offend each other, and we absolutely will offend each other because we're imperfect humans, Uh, when we inevitably sin, as we seek to follow Jesus as fully devoted disciples, what we recognize is we're going to fail. And when we sin against our brother or sister and they come to us and they speak to us about our sin, we should humbly submit ourselves to them and be better for it. But if we don't, they should love us enough to continue to follow this process that Jesus himself laid out for his church with a hope that we might ultimately be brought back to repentance. Now, I want to acknowledge Um, culturally in America, um, we love our individualism, right? We love our own selfish, our self-expression. We don't want to be told by anybody. Here in modern day America, we think we get to define what is true. The apostle Paul is like, um, not for the church, that Jesus Christ himself gets to define what is true and that we should speak the truth to one another in love. And humbly submit ourselves to one another as the body of Christ. And to the extent that we're unwilling to do that, that we persist in ongoing and unrepentant sin, the church should love us enough to speak the truth to us and say, listen, you've claimed outwardly to be a follower of Jesus, but what is clear is you are a follower of your sin, of yourself, of your own desires, and not of Jesus Christ. You are no longer a part 
of this church. Now, the Apostle Paul wants to be really clear about something. In verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. And apparently, the, the Corinthian believers, the church there, they thought Paul was talking about people outside of the church. And so maybe they were even withdrawing, like, man, those worldly people, man, they're out there living sexually immoral lives. We're not going to have anything to do with them. But Paul wants to correct them and be very clear about what he meant. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. We live in a world that is full of sin. When we leave this gathering and we go out into the world, we should expect to see sin. After all, if you're an unbeliever, you're not a follower of Jesus. You haven't been made a new creation. You haven't been reconciled to God or filled with his spirit. But then Paul turns our attention, not outward, but instead inward on this body and this gathering of believers. Verse 11, he says, But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, And if you thought this was only a sermon about sexual sin, you were wrong. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or of greed or is an idolater, which means he elevates anything to the place of God in his life, he's a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. You should withdraw fellowship from them. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Now purge the evil person from among you. Now this is a difficult teaching. But here at Cross Community, we are committed to being rigorously and unapologetically biblical. And what we're not going to do is land on the texts that seem to, to build us up and affirm the things that we wish to affirm and ignore the difficult texts that press us in certain areas. Now, there is no committee being formed. Don't worry. You can all relax, especially those of you who totally blew it this weekend. There's no committee being formed to hunt anyone down and, and to start kicking people out of the church. But what we do want to do today, what I want to do, believing that sin always leads to destruction and death, and that obedience to Jesus always leads to abundance. And so I want, you to, want to call you again to remind you that Jesus has called his church to be holy as he is holy. And so just three quick practical things that I have for you today. Number one, if you find yourself living in sin, and not just sexual sin, if your heart's full of greed, full of envy, full of gossip, full of hatred, full of unforgiveness, If you find ongoing and unrepentant sin in your life, I want to to beg you today to repent and follow Jesus. Because I really do believe that sin always leads to destruction, but obedience always leads to abundance. You want to know true life. It's not in indulging your sin. It's in following Jesus. So today, as we have a time of invitation, you might just get down on your knees or bow right where you are, and you just confess your sin to Jesus. It's sin because you called it sin. And even if all of the world uh, applauds it and cheers it, I'm going to call it sin, and I'm going to turn away from that sin and instead follow Jesus. That's what repentance is. And maybe that's you today. Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, as he posted those 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg, do you know what the first thesis said? That repentance is an ongoing part of the life of a believer. It is a continual thing that we practice day after day after day. And if you haven't repented in a while, you're probably not following Jesus with any level of sincerity. So first thing is maybe today you need to repent of your sin. You need to practice James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Maybe you're here today. And rather than belonging to this body, rather than being a part of the body of Christ, you've just been showing up on Sundays. And rather than following Jesus Christ, 
and seeing yourself as belonging here, submitting yourselves to the men and women who comprise this body of believers, you're just showing up on Sunday. Rather than being a part of the team, you've just been sitting in the stands watching the show. Jesus is calling us to something deeper, that we would make up the body of Christ, that people, when they look at us, they would see the body of Jesus united and committed to one another, practicing the one another's of Scripture. Maybe today, when we leave here, you need to go to the Welcome Center. You're like, hey, I, I got to sign up for a membership class. And I want to be a part of this body. I want to submit myself to the believers here who are going to care for me and love me and walk with me through this life. And the third thing, maybe for you, God's been drawing your heart to faith for some time. And this would be about the most unlikely message ever for you to respond in faith to Jesus Christ. But maybe Jesus Christ has been drawing your heart to him in faith for a while. You've come to understand the gospel that Jesus Christ loved you enough to die on the cross for your sin that you might find true and rich and lasting abundant life in him. And today it's just time for you to go public with your faith in him, to entrust your life fully to Jesus and to become a follower of him. I know this is a hard text, but if we only follow Jesus on the easy things, we're not really following him, are we? So today, I want to invite you to respond in obedience to Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your grace. That you are a God who forgives, who extends grace to us, and Lord, what we merely have to do is repent, practice this process over and over and over. When we fall down, when we find ourselves in sin, we confess that it is indeed sin and we turn away from that and follow you once again. Lord, for the person in this room that doesn't know you, I pray that today might be the day of salvation. They might fully entrust their lives to you, come to faith in you. And Lord, for those who have just been kind of loosely attached, they go to church but they aren't the church. They might say this is their home, but they're not in. They're on the periphery. I pray that you might stir their hearts and draw them to commit to being a part of this body, Lord. We pray that you would be honored and glorified in this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I want to invite you to stand and respond with obedience to Jesus Christ.